Hey, hey, welcome to Film Fanatics, three film geeks discussing movies both new and old. My name is Dan. My name is Justin. And I'm Joe. In Avengers Age of Ultron, the sequel to the original Avengers, obviously, the Avengers must work together to defeat Ultron, who is the new villain, voiced by James Spader, a technological enemy accidentally created by Tony Stark and Bruce Banner, who is now bent on a vendetta for human extinction. He also recruits, of course, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, who are apparently not mutants in this universe. I feel like I have to kind of put some of my nostalgic and uh, geekisms aside a little bit here. I will admit when I saw the movie with everybody in the big group, I actually had a lot of fun watching it. Uh, I think this movie is is full of Joss Whedon's obvious dialogue, a lot of his quips, jokes. They're all over the place here. Uh, This story does try to be a little bit darker than the first one, but I'm not entirely sure it succeeds because it's still trying to be really, really fun. Which isn't really a bad thing, but it's kind of at odds with itself there. There's a lot going on. I think the the one positive and negative, I think they're kind of very closely interrelated, is that there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of characters, there's a lot of plot points, a lot to kind of move the story and the characters forward. But there's almost so much going on that it isn't really that easy to absorb all of it. Most particularly, though, the biggest thing for me was the action scenes. I didn't think they were quite as good as the last one. Now, admittedly, I think the strength of the first movie was that it was relatively simple and straightforward in its plot, and it also had the benefit of uh, being built up by all these other movies, so it felt like it was kind of the culmination of various storylines, where here, it's like they're just kind of throwing a lot of things together, and some of it works, and some of it not so much. Uh, I think James Spader does a pretty good job as the villain. He's kind of fun. Not as dark as I was expecting, but still kind of enjoyable. Uh, there were some plot points. I'm not sure if they <laughs> completely worked out the well as they did. There's kind of a, a romance between Black Widow and the Hulk, which is sort of there, and you don't really know if it's going to go anywhere, and spoilers, it really doesn't, but I don't know if anybody's really surprised there. On the whole, though, it's still fun. The actress is still having a great time. I'm glad that Jeremy Renner got a lot more to do. I liked some of the quiet moments with the characters. But on the whole, I think this is a fun romp, but the original movie's still significantly better. I leave Age of Ultron with a B plus. Hmm. Well, one of the reasons that the original Avengers was such a success, other than it was a great film, but it was the first time we ever saw all of our favorites from the Marvel Cinematic Universe all together, and Age of Ultron, by design, cannot recapture that magic. Uh, But it does do a lot of things right. I actually kind of did like the romance storyline with Black Widow and the Hulk. I thought it was interesting. You're right, it doesn't really... Go anywhere, go anywhere yeah. but you know it was it was cutesy. I can't say I hated it. I just yeah. not entirely sure if it was. It is what it is. Before. Well, I mean, these movies aren't based around the romances. I mean, other than Iron Man and Pepper Potts, well, you know, no. which even then isn't that great. Exactly. But, but you know, I don't typically like the romances in, that are forced in movies. I thought this one was okay, mm-hmm. but I feel like there's so much going on in this movie. This is just another plot point that isn't really that developed. Well, yeah, I suppose that's true. It might not be as developed as as some others, but I, I thought it was all right. Um, I liked Elizabeth Olsen. Absolutely loved Paul Bettany as Jarvis. I thought he did a great job. Spader as Ultron does a fine job as well. Didn't have any problems with him. Um, some of the other newbies I can do without. Uh, I'm coming around on Colby Smulders, actually. I wasn't a huge fan of her being in the series uh, previously. Aaron Taylor Johnson's okay. I'm not a huge <laughs> fan of his. I thought his accent was terrible. Well, so was um, hers, to be honest. Her, well, hers was just thicker, I feel like. I thought hers yeah. was all right. That's a fair assessment. You they, know, they it's, were... it's no Tom Hardy in Child 44. No, but, but, <laughs> That's a great Russian accent. No, but I, I did feel well, no. both their accents were kind of fluctuating a little bit, mm. but, you know. Um, I did think that the action sequences were, were pretty good. I thought the story was very strong, and I do love how we got the backstory about Hawkeye's character. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that, that they did give Jeremy Renner some more to do there. But it does fall short of the first film in other aspects. Uh, for one thing, I never got the sense here that the Avengers were ever in that much trouble. Um, I don't know if that's has something to do with knowing that everyone from the core group and then some is signed on for all of these movies. So well, you know you're not really going to lose any of the major characters. I think it's... Like Agent Coulson in the first movie? Yeah, that, I mean, that's understandable. You know? It's true. So the, the stakes never really seem quite as high as uh, even in some of the lesser MCU films like The Dark World. I also think that since there was such a success uh, going the comedy route with Guardians of the Galaxy, Age of Ultron is trying a little too hard with the jokes. Yes. I feel like they needed a better balance here, um, more akin to what we saw in Captain America, The Winter Soldier. Um, but still, though it's not the original, Joe, I, I certainly agree with that. That was an A for me. It was in my top ten of that year. Um, but it was a lot of fun. One of the better recent entries in the Marvel Universe. I as well give it a B+. Justin, how about for you? When we, when we reviewed the first one, 
I hit it pretty hard for for Joss Whedon's TV background. I felt came a little too strong in in the actual end product. This one avoids that, but only because it's just so downright chaotic. Instead of letting the imagery breathe and the action sequences speak for themselves, one of the things I really loved about the first film was it did such a great job of letting you take in the whole atmosphere, but also giving every single action sequence a story. Sometimes you have Thor and Hulk. Other times you have a really cool Captain America race against time story, which honestly gets better and better upon repeat viewings. This one, it's just chaotic because they're trying to get everybody in the same frame all the time, and it's just ridiculous and honestly kind of claustrophobic. In, in the end, it just ends up feeling like Whedon's sort of just charging forward with everything that he's got, trying to please everyone, and in the end, only hitting about maybe 60% of the time. Paul Bettany's great, I, I agree yeah. with you. Spader's good in spurts. There were these times where they basically turn him into a cartoon character for basically no reason. That's what he is. But it shouldn't be. I mean, I I thought about it... Well, with, go ahead. <laughs> I thought about it with Tom Hilston in the first movie, where uh-huh. he's ominous, but he also gets a couple like snarky one-liners here and there. Mm-hmm. Ultron tries to be ominous, and then you'll have these moments where he's like trying to throw in these really, really bad jokes to try and appeal to, to try and be more kid-friendly so it doesn't get too dark, because, God forbid, anything happens that takes the MCU in a darker alley. It's still fun, and I can't exactly say I didn't enjoy myself watching it. It's just really making me concerned about where the MCU is heading next, and I think it's throwing way too much too quickly. I leave it with a B. I will admit that there was a lot going on, and I think that they tried to envelop too many characters, Mm -hmm. and I didn't quite understand why some were in it during the fights and then some weren't, like... Um, Falcon shows up like at the very beginning and then never again <laughs> until the final scene. But then War Machine was actually like fighting with them. Yeah. I, that didn't gel with me. Like, I didn't really understand why. I mean, I get it. They're all part of it. Yeah. There's also one giant plot hole with Iron Man that I'm still not entirely sure how to feel about. Iron Man 3. Not exactly a spoiler, but spoilery. <laughs> Safe assumption about midway through the movie. He kind of figures out a way to control Iron Man without needing to be in the suit. Yeah. Right. Yet in this one he's in the suit the entire time even though we know all well and good that he doesn't need that he doesn't need to be there anymore. No, but he's Iron Man. That's, I mean, that's, 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 that's basically part of the reason why you know. there there can't be an Iron Man 4 because he already has that sentience. He can he can control them right off yeah, the bat. Yeah, but I mean that's people don't want more regular man. That was one of the big problems with Iron Man three. That was know? one of my least favorite things in Iron Is Man. Is that he's they, he's out of the suit all the time. You you go to see him in the suit. But that's sort of that's sort of a plot hole akin to well, how come in their own movies then they don't just summon everyone else to help them? Hey, with can their you help problems? me out, Cap? Like I mean, I, that's a minor issue I think for me. Yeah, I mean, you're right. He doesn't have to be in the suit. Yeah. he probably shouldn't be. But it's a comic book movie. You want to see Iron Man fight people. You know, it's just kind of that like... That was just, one of my big problems with the third movie. Just, let's just see Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, it's Robert people. Downey Jr. Yes. hanging out with a kid the whole movie. Like, so I, weird. <laughs> well, let's not get on Iron Man 3. Yeah, I was, was going to say, Iron Man 3 is a conversation for another day. But yeah. yeah, you brought it up. I apologize. Go ahead. But like I said, I I feel like they weren't entirely sure how to feel about Guardians of the Galaxy. And then when people liked the, the tonal shift with Guardians of the Galaxy being more playful, they tried to throw that in. I agree with you 110%. I, I think that's exactly what happened. It's, <laughs> it just feels awkward Mm -hmm. and that's why i feel like spader just is trying to have the same ominous presence and doesn't fit the bill at all well i don't know i kind of disagree with you there first of all you gotta you know go with the writing that he was given to i mean you're right not all the jokes are great but i know i got some laughs out of him i I will admit it's kind of an interesting interpretation for ultron because ultron is basically a robot i mean really he doesn't have much personality he's Mm -hmm. like humans are bad kill them that's pretty much Ultron. So they injected more personality, and he's basically the dark version of Tony Stark. So I thought some of the quirkiness and the humor worked because it sounded like you were listening to Iron Man talking, you know. So that's kind of one reason it didn't work for me, you know. Which is another big thing. It's like they're also trying to foreshadow later things to come, Civil War particularly, and I don't know how I feel about Tony Stark just randomly going darker because the story needs him to. I don't know. I. I do think that his jump is maybe a little bit forced, but I think the whole theme of this movie was everybody does kind of have a dark side, and I think some of the serious moments did work, but 
the biggest issue with the movie, you guys kind of touched on it, as did I, is that it's sort of a balanced thing because it wants to be a darker story. And technically it is, but it doesn't really feel like the stakes are that high because Ultron's kind of a Not jokey, funny villain. Like, right. hey, like he doesn't even really seem that that determined or evil. No. And they're also throwing in jokes every single scene. Too Everybody, much everybody's got to get in line. <laughs> hey, get my line. I'm just like, and so you'll have a joke about certain characters and then that certain character dies and you're like okay this is supposed to be emotional but one character literally joked about killing him two scenes ago <laughs> so you know it's kind of almost hinting maybe we shouldn't care that much about uh -huh. this person you know what i'm saying i do so you know yeah it's, it's uneven but well, and when you throw this many people in like thor honestly is barely even in this movie the hulk disappears for whole fights too. <laughs> yeah. right the hulk disappears for huge chunks of time, Hawkeye and Black Widow are both in this movie a lot more which is than good. some of the main Avengers, which I know they're main well, Avengers, but well, to the, be fair, the core four that have had their own movies. With the direction right. that the team is going, it kind of makes sense, yeah. you know, by the way, the reveal at the end, so I, I'm kind of okay with that. Like, one big problem was, you know, Black Widow and Hawkeye not getting enough time. They're getting more yeah, of the center. Yeah, I agree with that. That's important. Speaking of which, how do you guys feel about, about that uh, aspect the way the direction's going with uh, the team and everything? With the with, uh, direction, theoretically, yes. Well, just from my experience, uh, the way... Let's put it this way. Uh, the way the Avengers comics are, there's a certain type of team that's not necessarily all A-listers. And I never read it <laughs> because I didn't care. Is Ant-Man one of them, by chance? Yes. Okay. So, you know, really, like, this isn't really spoilers, but the primary team of the Avengers in the comics most of the time is Ant-Man, Wasp... Sometimes Black Widow, Captain America is usually there, hmm. Hawkeye, Vision, and maybe like one or two of the big people like Iron Man or Thor. I was once say Iron Man's usually there. Sometimes. But that's like the six core people right there who are, with the exception of Cap, mostly like B level characters. Mm -hmm. And so they'll have bigger guest stars come in for bigger events. Like, right. Like the way they set it up in the first movie, it's basically all the headliners. You got Hulk, you sure. got Thor, you know, and that's what attracts people to the comic and the movies. I have a faith in Marvel. They've been able to turn most of their products like Guardians of the Galaxy. That is true. Nothing's into something great. So if they go this direction, I'm okay with it. But I wonder how audiences that are used to seeing certain characters around more are going to be okay maybe following movies that don't have some of them in there. Well, and I just feel like it, it's going to bloat each of the movies so that eventually like part two of... Um, Infinity, Infinity War. Wars like is another... going to be like three hours and ten minutes because there's going to be like 20 main characters. And, you know, this is interesting. Um, and, and this is really kind of funny. I, I don't know how I feel about it, but I feel like Joss Whedon's really trying, and the whole MCU, they're trying to emulate comic book storylines right. where everything's connected, things cross over, and the Avengers are the big culmination of this. But what we're beginning to notice is that one of the big issues with comic books and crossovers, too much going on, too little time. Mm -hmm. This movie, as you said, Justin... What are they trying to do? They're trying to emulate the big two-page spread of all the characters fighting all the bad guys, which is awesome to see, but when you're literally seeing all the movement going and you don't have time to watch, look at every single image, mm -hmm. you're having all these characters there and you're not able to take it all in. So maybe they're emulating it a little too much, but then again, if it is like the final big battle is like all the characters fighting Thanos, I mean, everyone's <laughs> going to geek out even if it isn't perfect. So mm -hmm. if they didn't give us that, we'd be disappointed. So I'm not sure what to do about that. There's two big concerns for me. The first is, what does that mean for Civil War? Because I feel like that's going to be the major determinant. However, my bigger concern is the fact that it's going to be the first Avengers where we don't have the main people on board. It's going to be, based on what the rumors are, mostly the B-listers versus Thanos for the entire first movie and then get, and then get the main guys for part two, which I mean, we don't know I'm not sure how, how audiences are going to take that, to be honest with you. Then again, I don't know how audiences are going to take Civil War. So, well, from what I understand, Civil War is supposed to be like Avengers two point five anyway. Mm -hmm. So maybe we'll. I feel like we need more time to kind of build up certain characters a little bit more. Like they're cool. Like for instance, the Vision. Like very interesting character. But, but he comes. He comes in at like the end of. He's halfway into Act Two. I know he's basically Jarvis, but we still kind of need to know this character a little more. I know I kind of know who he is, but yeah. people, you know, you. I mean, I know you like them, Dan, but there there really isn't too much to him so far. Just no, kind of, I just thought it was a good performance. He's a good performance. But you're right. I, I mean, they don't give him much to do yet. Except, you know, like one thing that's pretty big. You yeah. Know, you know, but like I said, I like the fact they're trying to emulate the actual Avengers, but I'm not sure how well that'll translate. I'm sure people will go see the next movie, but well, we'll see. You know, I, I don't know. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I well, listen, people are going to see these movies until they're sick of them. Uh, you know, I, I think Ant-Man will be kind of the barometer of that. Mm-hmm. If nobody sees Ant-Man, mm. then they're going to be like, okay, so we can't just turn anything into a hot property. Mm-hmm. I think Ant-Man will do well. I certainly don't think it's going to do Guardians numbers. I doubt Not it. even remotely. Um, but, you know, I, I think it'll do well. But I think... My big problem with it really is just, A, the oversaturation of the movies themselves. We're getting now three a year in the in the Marvel... Maybe they're not all Marvel Cinematic Universe, but we've got Fantastic Four later on this year. Right. You know, which is... And they're all three here within three and a half months. Yeah. So I think that's a bit of over oversaturation. And I just think these movies are going to get more and more bloated the more we add into them from the different franchises. Mm-hmm. So... I, I fear for the three-hour Avengers movie. Well, I mean, we're getting closer and closer. To I, that, I so. know we are. I it's, know we are. It's probably going to happen. Yeah. It's, the question is, <laughs> are, they, are both parts going to be three hours? I right. seriously, seriously might be. hope not. Oh, my goodness. Might be. All right. And uh, you can subscribe to our channel if you have not done so yet. Uh, and also the Facebook group, Up and Running, Film Fanatics with an exclamation point, and the Twitter feed at Film Fanatics Pod. The five word reviews there are posted weekly leading up to that week's episode. So we'll see you back here next week. Bye.